Thank you, Louisa and Thais, and all the other massive staff. And thank you to the translators who did such a tremendous job throughout the symposium. And I'm particularly delighted to see the sign interpreters. And welcome to the people in the audience who communicate via sign language. It is a skill I much admire. Framing Children, a study in pink and blue. MASP, Sao Paulo, April 16th, 2016. My talk is three parts. It will run to around 45 minutes. Part one. April 16th, 1997. It is a warm spring day. We are at the playground. My daughter is sitting happily in the sandbox, eating sand. I figure once she's worked out that it doesn't taste at all that well, she'll stop. But the other mothers are mad, mad, mad at me. They're trying to teach their girls manners and boundaries. They're trying to teach them to be girls. This latter lesson is hard work. The hardest, in fact, for girlness does not come natural at all. Indeed, this sugar-sweet concoction is a matter of high artifice. And somehow, sand-eating does not enter into artifice. Had Elizabeth Caen d'Anvers been a child in 1944, she might have also eaten sand, but for entirely different reasons than my daughter. Sand eating might have been her means to alleviate hunger pains. Many people imprisoned in concentration camps try to eat dirt. However, Elizabeth Caen d'Anvers did not really eat dirt at a concentration camp. She died en route to Auschwitz. And she was no girl anymore in 1944. She was an old woman. Nevertheless, we will always remember her as a young girl, as a young girl depicted with her sister Alice in pink and blue, painted by Auguste Renoir in 1981. Uh, 1881, sorry. As it is, this was an obscene comparison and one for which I have to apologize. Today, I will not ask how Elisabeth Caen d'Avers came to be in Renoir's frame. At the time, he painted many portraits for Parisian Jewish families. Today, I will not even ask how pink and blue came to be in the possession of Pietro Maria Bardi before it appeared a centerpiece of the MASP collection. I trust that these issues have been thoroughly researched, publicly discussed, and institutionally resolved. Instead, I will try to look at some of the explicit and implicit frames that allow children to appear as children in our world. In other words, I will attempt to look at some of the aspects of the dispositif that is called childhood and begin to relate them to some of the questions popping up in museum practice. At present, Pink and Blue serves as the frontispiece of the Histories of Childhood exhibition, up, a few floors up, flanked by Pedro pa Perez Fascinajao, I don't speak Brazilian, Sao? So from 1909, and an untitled photo from 2006 by Barbara Wagner. This is Perez from 1909. And this is um, the pink and blue plus the photo by Barbara Wagner. I quote from the flyer for the exhibition. The exhibition is part of a project by MASP to juxtapose different collections, disregarding hierarchies and territories that would otherwise segregate them. 
In this sense, the histories in Historias da Infancia are also decolonizing histories and take on a political meaning. There is an understanding that the histories we can tell are not only those of dominant classes or of European culture and its visual conventions." End of quote. Based entirely on a formal trope, a color code, pink or red and blue, this highly polemic juxtaposition is an attempt at decolonization that does, in my view, do, do justice to none of the three works. We can probably all agree that Pedro Perez's painting is racism wrapped in the guise of sentimentality. A more honest, albeit still highly racist, depiction of what is going on here might be in this photo. Sorry, it's, um, I had to kind of secretly take, take this photo that I found um, on display in a Prague museum. Despite the fact that the Czech claim never to have been part of any colonial practice, a black girl somehow ended up in a Czech bourgeois household to be photographed as a subaltern. Maybe the girl in Paris painting is less fascinado than wondering whether she will only be tolerated in the front parlor as long as she serves the function of a playmate, a function that she shares with an inanimate doll. What is lost in the juxtaposition is the ambivalence of the representation of Alice and Elisabeth Caen d'Aver. And by somewhat straightening it, as opposed to queering it, it is dangerously discouraging an intersectional reading, thus homogenizing power relations. The ambivalence in pink and blue consists of the superimposition, or one of the ambivalences of pink and blue, the only one I will go into today, consists of the superimposition of two conflicting representational orders. One being a visualization of idealized childhood as we know it from the likes of Joshua Reynolds the age of innocence, it's called. This concept, Chine, construction of childhood, goes hand in hand with the inception of the bourgeoisie as a ruling class. Childhood, which had previously not been a visual category at all, children being portrayed instead as small adults, was conceived as an unfettered, naive, innocent, and pure, even otherworldly realm, untarnished by the adult world. But onto this representation is imposed another, one bearing the codes of aristocracy. The bourgeoisie's apparent need to put itself in the shoes of the former rulers led to this shameless appropriation. And you can see that even in the way that the, the um, curtain is cited in this big, which uh, in this painting, which is a sign of imperial rule. Even though I'm sure Renoir's pa Renoir painted the two girls anatomically accurately, that is identifiable as fiable as Alice and I, Elizabeth to those who knew them, they're appearing in the visual field only via the two dispositifs of idealized childhood and pompous bourgeoisie. This is the inescapable fact of the matter, that any form of representation of making visible comes at the price of a particular framing, or as Louis Althusser teaches us, subjectivity and subjection come in intertwined. The curious thing is that prevailing ideology presumes images of children to be somehow free of these constraints, as if power relations made an exception for children. The opposite is the case. Because children have relatively little power in the world, and because their relation to language and subjectivity is far from fully formed, their access to self-representation and their ability to determine their self-representations is stilted, which doesn't mean that they're not capable of it, as we can learn from the first talk today. 
This means that it is the adults who set the rules and premises, create the structures and technologies that allow for children to appear in the visual field. What can be said for images can also be posited for other spheres in which a person becomes visible. And thus the difficult question is not how can we give children access to the public sphere so that they become agents in their own right. It is, this is easy. Access presupposes not only the opening of doors. In the case of a museum, this would be, at the very least, mean abolishing entrance fees and subsidizing transport to the museum. Access furthermore necessitates that those already inhabiting a space move aside, a little bit at least, that they give up some of their own privileges. Uh, solidarity and access is not be to be had without this giving up of privilege. But the difficult question is another one. How can we create the situation in which children can participate as equals in the setting of the rules and premises of their own appearance and have a say in the def definition of what is meant by the public sphere. Second part. Playgrounds are one of the few forms of a public sphere, ness, in which children can appear as active subjects. But no matter how playgrounds are constructed, whether they are informal, like the ruins in this film by Leslie Dyken from 1957, or the streets that I used to play in at the as a child, or the ones created by Aktion Samtal that last showed us yesterday, or the ones built by municipalities, or the ones in shopping malls, this appearance does not come without socialization. And socialization has an aspect of violence to it. In formal playgrounds, a large part of the process of socialization is divested onto the architecture itself. We can extrapolate from the saws and hammers and Palle Nielsen's model a particular I ideology of the child, anti-authoritarian, just as we can from the contemporary US playground, yes, one, which um, the ideology has to do with safety. And there are safety measures taken, and the sole reason for that is that there's, in America, you can litigate really easily. So if someone slips and uh, hurts themselves there. Um, the municipality is involved in court cases. Or the shopping mall, where the child, and the ideology is the child as a consumer. Peter Friedel and these last three childs were from, from him, who has been photographing playgrounds around the world since 1994 and continues to do so shows the playground uninhabited by children and thus the function of the architecture as a framing device is laid bare. Playground architecture plus, plus the children moving in it function as a perfect example of Bruno Latour's concept of actants and their interaction must be understood as a mediation of social norm. Maybe this is why it is for the most time so incredibly boring to watch children play at a playground. Fortunately for us all, children tend to find loopholes, even if it is only to create conflict, like eating sand, 
or to produce chaos. As an aside, the film that best exemplifies the regulatory side of actants, their mediating function within the stratification of modern society, and the power of non-human actors to subvert the system is um, Jacques, Jacques Dati's playtime. Um, but in this, children play only a minor role. Yet another iteration of an actant is Ricardo Bas Baum's work, Would You Like to Participate in an Artistic Experience? Its invitation to engage with his sculpture called New Basis for Personality or Basis for a New Personality, I would describe as playful. Um, and I chose this because I think you all know it. I mean, he made this form and he continues to, it's been for some time and then she, he, he gives them to people and people can do whatever they want to do with it and then they give it to someone else and the only thing that is necessary for them to do is at some point to document, make a photo or something of how they're using this, um, this sculpture and he believes that it actually changes people. And this is how, um, how this work was represented at Do Documenta. Um, here you see castle um, workers who actually produced them. So we produced these in Kassel. And here you see um, people who can look at the um, different iterations, a documentation of the different iterations of this sculpture, but actually there, they, this space was mostly used in different ways. When I describe the action that Ricardo proposes to his audience as playful, I'm referring to psychologist Peter Gray's definition of play. He names the following characteristics. Play must be self-chosen and self-directed. The means must be more valued by the player than the ends. Just think of a sandcastle. You don't own a sandcastle. I mean, there's nothing to do with a sandcastle afterwards. So it's really about the process of making it. The structure and rules of play emanate from the minds of the player. So it's an attitude. Play is imaginative and non-literal. And it requires an active, alert, and non-stressed mind. This is a, a f very famous photo by Helen Lewitt from the 50s of showing children in New York playing on the street. Gray insists that play, whether it is constructive or social dramatic or formal play, be defined as an attitude and that it's, its most important aspect is the freedom to quit playing any time. If these requirements are met, play is not just a way to pass time, but helps children to cope with the world in all sorts of ways. Their ability to quit is also what distinguishes the players um, in Priscilla's Fernandez video from adult workers. That was the video we saw yesterday that Lars showed us. On the other hand, Gray asked parents to be less worried about the influence of play on their offspring. And I quote him, violent play doesn't create violent adults. Violence in the adult world leads children, quite properly, to play at violence. It is wrong to think that somehow we can reform the world for the future by controlling children's play and controlling what they learn. If we want to reform the world, we have to reform the world. On the other hand, Gray admonishes adults for their attempts to functionalize play in their gambits at education. 
And here it seems to me that museum mediators and educators and curators need to listen extra carefully. Aside from the fact that using play for an end takes away the child's right to self-determined experimentation and ultimately her chance to find out how to meet her own needs while negotiating with the needs of others, Gray believes that functionalization of ch children's play simply does not work. Children learn to detect it when adults try to invoke play. And they resist protective embraces like playgrounds, Gray believes. Instead, they venture out into the real world, which they often incorporate into their play. If play is institutionalized, even as an educational program at a museum, it becomes just as disciplinary as education. Close to our installation of Ricardo Basbaum's piece at Documenta 12, we place Gerwald Rockenschaub's Klassenzimmer, classroom. With this work, Rockenschaub reacted to our so-called islands of mediation, which were distributed all over the venues of Documenta. Here you see one of them. But most, prominent, most prominently appeared at the pavilion, a structure we built for the purpose of showing art in the 21st century mode, which we defined as one where one can sit and talk to each other in the presence of art. So I would be of a different opinion than the last speaker. I do think that the art is absolutely essential to this process. Oscillating between rigid form and ironic quote, Hockenschaub countered our ideal of contemplation, community, and activism with an overtly authoritarian environment, calling into question the meaning of art mediation and the way we inserted as curators mediation into our curatorial program. Hockenschaub's island of mediation, or classroom, which incidentally looked a bit like playground furniture, became one of the most popular sites for selfies and other forms of spontaneous spectator performativity, possibly because there's something incredibly satisfying about playing at stereotypes. Uh, we were, as children, really bored with school, but then when we came home, we played school. And we played school in, in stereotypical ways. Um, to sum up this second part of my presentation, I propose that there is not so much difference between children's right to play and an enlightened form of education, which would be one where children can choose themselves what they want to learn and in which way they want to learn it and when they want to learn it. Part three. <laughs> Maybe some of you have noticed that most of the time when concepts of children as participants of the social sphere are invoked, the children are of a certain age, let's say at least primary school age. I believe this is the case not because or not only because children have then acquired language skills and are thus deemed to be capable of interaction but rather because when children have acquired language skills, adults can more successfully cathect them as adults to be. While the child pre-language is potentially threatening all that ad adult subjectivity is based on. Generally, our, the, our whole idea of raising a child is based on the presumption of potentiality. We are always looking at children with an eye to the future. At the same time, most of our psychoanalytic theories extrapolate the adult out of childhood experience. Thus, for all intent of pr and purposes, there is a continuum between babyhood and adulthood, which we nevertheless insist on segmenting and framing. Seldom do we cast a loving eye at children in their simple being like Litvin van de Wien does in her video Omayad Mosque, Damascus. I just show a short excerpt from this. <laughs>
I doubt that Litvin is actually that much interested in children. Rather, her point in showing a female child which is allowed to be in her own space within the public sphere of a mosque is to present a radically different image of Islam than the one purported in the Western media. For the purpose of today's presentation, what is more relevant to me here is that both the amateur clip and Litvin's video show the propping up of the young child via the adult gaze. And thus, it indirectly acknowledges this gaze as part of the picture. I'd like to refer to this gaze in an early work by Mary Kelly, which speaks of a mother-child relationship. Um, these are actually rather small like this, so they're um, very distorted here. Prima Para from 1974, this is the bathing series. There's another series um, that belongs to this work. Deals with pleasure, the pleasure and danger of looking. Without launching into a fully fledged interpretation, it can be asserted that the look this work examines is a complicated one. These photos are imbued with ambivalence. It is an ambivalence that is hoovering somewhere between the intelligible and the unintelligible, one that is not easily acknowledged, but through the photograph can be grasped, if not firmly. It is the ambivalence of a mother or any caretaker, uh, the ambivalence a mother or any caretaker feels towards an infant, one that results from too much closeness, coupled with a sense of isolation from the rest of the world, and one that comes out of the repressed sexual feelings towards this other being that is not yet a subject, more like an other, which one nevertheless takes care of and cherishes. It is finally an ambivalence that not, that not only finds expression in the photograph, but implicates us, the onlookers, through an uncanny doubling of the look of mother and photographer and the specific cropping of the images. To quote Sigmund Freud, something that should have remained hidden has come to light. What might have stayed in privacy and there sometimes festers into the violence of child abuse, but in any case contains all the little violences with which the child is brought into the adult world, has been made public. And in this public, we suddenly find ourselves in a not so neutral place, Again, we have been positioned as spectators. The issue that arises for me, and this is also to be found in the exhibition, I forgot its name, but I thought it was a really uh, beautiful painting. The issues that arise, issue that arises for me most pressingly when I start picturing children as agents of the kind of public sphere that we call a museum is that we must acknowledge in a radical way our own relationality to children. So, um, it, not just to look at children and what we can do for them, but actually to, to really think of what children do for us and how we change with them. Instead of compartmentalizing the child as either client or a free agent, Instead of thinking of how to educate the child or leave it be, we need to ask what changes in us or what needs to change when we attempt to really recognize the child. I don't see any children in the audience here and also not on the list of speakers, so really all we can speak about truthfully is ourselves. There are a few museums who put up such an interesting show on childhood as the one to be seen right now at Maspi. And I'm sure I could extend this compliment to Maspi's other history shows on madness, on sexuality, on feminism, on slavery. But framing these topics in specific shows only is a bit like celebrating Mother's Day within patriarchy. I thought that would produce a laugh. <laughs> If, on the other hand, 
We picture the complicated and conflicted relationality of children and adults and admit that we would be nothing without children. We would simply not be without children. Can we begin to do the justice to children and to ourselves? A museum that does this will never be the same. The question is, would a museum still be? And this is for Pablo. Thank you. E até curioso, antes da sua fala, uma pessoa aqui do museu me chamou porque um dos trabalhos do Playgrounds do grupo inteiro que é um trepa-trepa dentro de uma estrutura de um ônibus. É, ele estava ele na dúvida porque ele falou está tendo acontecendo alguma coisa, eu acho que precisa ser interditado. É, você não quer ir lá ver? E eu falei, eu não sei, eu não sei o que fazer. Decidam vocês. Eu não sei se eu consigo ter autoridade de dizer quando que... e colocar um limite no uso de um, de um objeto ou de, de alguma coisa. Mas, enfim, eu queria saber também se alguém tem alguma pergunta, várias perguntas, então acho que vale a pena a gente ouvir. É, por favor, você conhece, você disse que não há criança aqui falando, e estamos falando pelo ponto de vista do adulto. Você conhece algum museu que tenha conselho de crianças? Obrigado. Yes. Well, um, I can tell you that I'm in the process of m not making a museum, but making an institution where primary school children will be the ones responsible for collecting work for their school. And I'm talking about serious artwork. Um, because I, I, I mean, this was a polemical question. We all, I think, we agree that there's a problem. At least I think there's a problem. Oi, é, bom, bom dia ainda, né? É, eu nem sei, <laughs> são tantas perguntas. É, como, é, como você acha que o museu pode, além das exposições temporárias que tratam da infância e tentam dialogar com a infância, como o museu pode, das infâncias, como o museu pode estabelecer esse diálogo fora do, do âmbito das exposições e além das atividades educativas, e se a comunicação dos museus teria algum papel e teria como participar desse processo em algum sentido e experiências se há exemplos. Well, I just have to say that I think that dialogue dialogue is is only the very very first and probably easiest step of all. I remember that uh, when my, my daughter was at sc primary school, 
the municipality invited them to make a drawing workshop, a drawing competition where they could in deal with the fact that right out of the school there was a, uh, were two big streets crossing, so it was a very dangerous, um, th there was very dangerous traffic, on t and on top of that, um, the, the street lights were changing, and the, you had to wait a long time to cross the street. So the municipality thought something should be done about that. They invited the students, and the students came up with really, really interesting ideas, some of them very phantasmatic, like making slides across the street, but others very pragmatic, like just saying, change the phases of the streetlights, which is something that could be done. But to change the phases of the streetlights would have an impact on the whole city. Yeah? So if you want to take serious the kids, you might have to change the whole city. And this is what an institution or our structures are not able to cope with. So the frustrating thing is then children are invited to have ideas and then um, there's even a prize, but then none of their proposals get taken seriously. So the problem is not opening up for dialogue, the problem is how to acknowledge what the children are saying and then really think of what that, how that implicates the structure. I think dialogues are done in many ways and they're fabulous mediators, they're fabulous curators. I don't think that there are any people as such. I mean, there are, there are better and worse ideas and practices, but in general, I think people are willing or they acknowledge change, and, and this is not just about children. It's obviously not just about an issue of children. And we had, the, I think, these these um, exhibition titles for the history exhibitions stated very clearly. I mean, there's one about slavery, and interestingly, there's none about class. But um, there's one on gender or sexuality. There's one on feminism, and so on. So, this is um, this is a question that concerns more than children is just that with children it becomes um, so visible for all of us. Obrigado. Eu vou fazer uma pergunta, vou fazer em inglês ou em português? Eu queria fazer uma pergunta que eu queria fazer para a Lilian, depois reformulei na minha cabeça para para a Mônica, então Desculpa se para você, mas eu acho que também as pessoas podem... Um, que tem relação com essa, essa ideia de democracia que a Lilian falou, a democracia como um sistema que eu acho emocionalmente convincente, é, completamente. Essa situação de comunidade onde é, não tem possibilidade de definir o que é o que não é. Uma abertura radical, que é uma fragilidade absoluta, como a gente está vendo agora no sistema... Oh, no mundo em geral, mas aqui no Brasil. Não? Então, é, nessa situação de fragilidade, o que você precisa, talvez, para agir lá é uma, talvez, uma certeza que permite você agir na fragilidade. Não? Ah, então, em relação ao que você Rus, falou, acho que isso quer dizer que provavelmente a, a experiência europeia de educativa dos últimos 40, 50 anos é um fracasso porque a Europa não aprendeu a viver com a fragilidade da democracia, mas ao contrário, é, a fechar. É, eles, a Europa é um sistema que decidiu se fechar. Não? Então, estava pensando em relação a isso, que também a Comunica falou, como é possível um, criar um, uma educação nessa certeza de viver na incerteza? Então, acho que o único... Ou como, ou como entrar num jogo, como você falou, entrar num jogo onde você sempre pode sair. Não? Um jogo que não é um projeto, um jogo que não é um programa, um jogo que não tem uma finalidade, não? em relação com a Mônica falou. Então, em política, eu acho que um, aqui no Brasil, nos últimos meses, o experimento, o, o proposta, o, a, a ação política mais é, que vai mais nesse sentido foi feita por crianças, relativamente. Não? É, o que é uma criança é uma questão difícil de definir, é uma questão essencializar. A criança pode trabalhar, certo, a criança pode ter sexo, certo, 
Um, mas aqui eram crianças, eram pessoas que não são adultos, não? pessoas de 15, 14, 16. Então, eu estava perguntando o que tem essas crianças é, que lhes permite trabalhar numa situação de incerteza. Talvez seja, não sei, talvez eu estava lançando isso aqui, que é um, um não ter naturalizado certos processos. É, eu estava lá no um museu no Equador recentemente, os educadores falavam que um museu super lindo, com vitrines incríveis, com objetos pré-colombianos dentro. É, a educadora falava que que os, as crianças não sabem ainda, muitos deles, que o que você deveria olhar é o que está dentro da vitrine, e não a vitrine, que é uma vitrine incrível. Sim. É que a vitrine é interessante porque é um espelho, e você pode se ver no espelho, é, a escultura pré-colombiana de 5 mil anos não é interessante, porque está atrás. Então, talvez, eu queria, talvez você especular em que faz, ou se, se é verdade, que, ou se é certo que esse ser criança pode eh, ajudar a viver uma certa incerteza, e que é o que uma criança tem para viver nessa incerteza melhor que o adulto? Ou talvez eu estou fazendo umas premissas já que estão fechando a situação demais. Um, se faz sentido isso. Bem, well, eu não acho que haja uma grande diferença, except for power relations between children and adults. So to look at children for, for a solution is, I think, the wrong term. I think children are just a different formation, a different social formation. Um, and basically, it's one that we're not relating to in the way that I think we should be relating to. That was one of my arguments. Um, And maybe if we start to relate to this for, uh, social relation, formation and other social formations that we have made take the place of the subaltern, then we will have some change, yeah? So that's, so basically maybe it can help us. I don't think that there's anything um, free or uh, better in this social formation. In fact, um, I could have shown you many examples of where children are incredibly violent to each other. So there's, I mean, there's a violence of gendering, there's a class violence with, you know, there's all kinds of violences with the children um, as well. So it's not a pure category at all. On the question of democracy, Also, democracy, I mean, we don't have a better system, but there's a di di democracy goes hand in hand with violence as well. I mean, the democracy has, from the beginning of its conception in Greece, democracy been based on the exclusion of those who are not thought of as agents of citizens, subjects. Yeah, so at that those times it was slaves and women. And it's still based on that principle. So the community that is built by democracy is a one that, that actually functions in part through exclusion. And that's why I think it was so important what Lillian said to this morning, you know, to conceive of democracy not as something that is given to us or that we can just inhabit, but something that we have to continue to to practice and question in its definition. So that is an ongoing process, you know, um, and one that will probably be never be finished. In terms of the European situation, um, I would like to quote, yeah, I, I think that, um, that yes, if you look at Europe as a formation of state, as the European Union, but if you look at people's practices, it's much less homogeneous than you have now prescribed it. So there are a lot of people very, very, very active right now um, in the whole refugee situation. They're not very happy with how a Euro the European Union is, um, is handling the situation, and there's also a huge right-wing drive, which is very, very scary. 
Um, it's propped up by the media, something you guys here in this country know very well, what, how the media can play politics. Um, so that there's the activi activities of people who are actually helping migrants or taking this as a welcome situation, a situation where we as Europeans can somehow renew ourselves through the people who are coming in. These are not shown to the extent that they're happening within the public sphere. Yeah, so that's my, maybe why there is a distortion that's going on in how it's being described. But I think it's actually a rather hopeful situation. Politically, I think it's a hopeful situation. Um, on the fragility, I agree with you. I mean, the, the good thing is you had that in the little game where the woman, the, the, the girl was standing balancing. Is if you have fragility, that means you have to remain alert and active. And that's something good. Sorry, did you want to answer this? Vou aproveitar a pergunta do Pablo para colocar uma questão que, desde a fala do Lars, eu estava pensando, que é um pouco qual a origem do nosso interesse aqui pela infância. O que, que ele explica da gente? Ou, ou, como a Ruth colocou, o que as crianças fazem por nós? E eu acho que a gente olha muito para as crianças quando a gente está com medo, quando a gente está em crise. E aí a gente quer descobrir qual que é o futuro que a gente tem. E não vai encontrar respostas. E... Mas também a gente olha para a infância é, pensando no nosso destino, como humanidade, para olhar para os condicionamentos que as instituições, de alguma forma, as instituições que a gente criou nos aprisionam em alguns sentidos. E talvez olhar para as crianças nos permita desconstruir algumas coisas. Então, eu fico pensando bastante sobre isso. assim é, Me choca, às vezes, me chocou, às vezes, o ano passado, quando os educadores, os adultos, os políticos adultos foram conversar com os jovens das ocupações e eles só diziam assim, a gente quer ouvir, a gente quer ouvir, a gente quer ouvir. E, num certo momento, o que os jovens tinham para dizer se esvaziou, porque os jovens, e talvez é, no, no sentido dessa... Qual é a certeza que sustenta todas as interrogações? Eu acho que, para os jovens, é a certeza de que os adultos estão cuidando do mundo de alguma forma, e que estão cuidando deles. Então, é, se a gente foge desse lugar, eles ficam sozinhos, e eles ficam sem perspectiva. E eu acho que isso sempre me impressionou na educação, como mãe, como educadora, como, como formadora de outros educadores, é que toda vez que a gente está numa relação educativa, o outro tem uma crença profunda em nós. E essa é uma das certezas que eu acho que pode estruturar uma uma construção democrática. E a outra certeza é que e é uma certeza difícil de, de, de manter e é, obriga a gente a desconstruir muito da nossa afetividade, é, que é a crença na excelência desse encontro com o outro, na potência. Mas aí eu estou falando assim de uma forma muito radical. Eu estou falando... Daí eu vou dar um exemplo que, para mim, funciona bem que é, eu acredito que é potente eu me encontrar com um fascista, por exemplo. Para usar um exemplo assim bizarro. Mas é, eu acredito. E nesse encontro, é, que é, de alguma forma, violento, como é violenta para a gente, às vezes, as estruturas que a gente constrói, ele, ele, é, ele é um encontro transformador de qualquer maneira. Não porque eu vou mudar o que, é o, que o outro pensa, mas é porque eu vou me mudar. Né? Então, acho que são essas duas convicções, para mim, que sustentam uma, uma instituição escolar democrática, que nunca é democrática, nos, é, nunca é uma democracia total, é sempre uma democracia em construção, mas que ela visa uma outra coisa também, ela não visa a si própria. Por isso também a gente nunca vai encontrar a estrutura maravilhosa que funciona. A estrutura é sempre precária. Porque o mais importante não é a estrutura, mas é que, se a gente não olhar para ela, ela vai nos capturar. É assim que eu 
pensaria nessa conversa entre nós aqui. Acho que a gente pode ser uma última questão e a gente já encerra. Tá? Ok. I will talk in English so Ruth can understand and it can be properly translated. But you have to talk louder. Ok. Um, I would actually... I've been thinking the whole time exactly around this question of uh, yeah, what, what children can, can do for us in a way. What is it that is so fascinating about play? And, um, and I remembered actually a definition of play that is a little bit different, but I feel that it goes, or, or, or some of the things that you were speaking about, ha I feel have an important relation to that. And it's uh, the definition of play as pure waste as pure excess. And I feel that somehow it's also a prison of myself, uh, but it's something that is very present here, this idea of finding some productivity out of it, something that we can, that we, that we can use for something. And I think that this notion of pure waste is what creates all these complicated relations with violence, with destruction, with things that are actually also quite necessary for change, which is also something that we're talking about. So, um, and I felt that a lot of what you were pointing at had to do with this, and I just wanted to, to ask you if you could maybe elaborate a bit on that reflection. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, I think it's at least for part of what play does a good definition, the pure waste. Um, and I think it's something that is um, important to acknowledge for, for institutions because it might shift the emphasis of product orientation towards, of, of, towards practice. So how do we live with ourselves? And are we, are we doing in everyday work practices what, we, what makes us happy? I think this is really relevant to ask and not to do things otherwise. And, and rather than say, but it must produce this or that. And for curating, for instance, that means that you m might radically risk failing with something, failing with an exhibition. And I don't know if you remember, but it actually helped us a lot that we had this, pr pr um, a document at 12 we had sent, this might also be failed failed, so we turn it into process instead of production. We try to turn as much into process. Um, so I think it has, without always thinking that process will be documented, that process will, um, will lead to something. One of the problems with the educational system is even with the democratic schools um, that are very prevalent in Europe as well, and um, parents put their children to these schools because they think they will somehow get a better education. They will, um, it's, a, it's considered something of a privilege. And then when the kids fail to do so, they take them out of the school. <laughs> Instead of seeing that it's a way of life. Yeah. There was another point, but I've forgotten that point. Yeah, I think I've forgotten that. Maybe we leave it to, to the discussion, to lunch. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>